One of those uh, decisions that we made uh, and just to kind of keep things as uniform as we can. But here we are in 1 Thessalonians now in chapter number 2. And, and just to remind you of some things, uh, the Apostle Paul had been in Thessalonica, and we'll see this as we uh, study the verses this, uh, this morning. The Apostle Paul did not get as much time as he wanted with the Thessalonians, uh, but uh, he gave them the gospel, and uh, they had the, the, the word, they had the Holy Spirit and the assurance of the gospel, and the Thessalonians grew, uh, even without the Apostle Paul being there as long as he wanted to be there. And we'll really see that in these verses that we'll look at this morning. But the Apostle Paul had been persecuted and chased out in one of his missionary journeys. Uh, he had traveled to Thessalonica, and the Jewish, uh, the Jewish people there uh, did not want to hear the gospel, and they persecuted Paul. They started a riot, and uh, they demanded that he leave. And so the Christians encouraged him to leave. And so he did. He went to Berea, and then the Thessalonian uh, Jews followed him to, Thess uh, to uh, Berea, rather, and uh, they chased him out of Berea. And so then he went to Athens after that, and he was just constantly hounded uh, in persecution. But, uh, but the, even though the Apostle Paul was going through such difficulties, uh, we see here in this passage, and we'll see over and over again, that the gospel ministry is worth every sacrifice that you make, and there is joy in the gospel ministry. Even in the midst of persecution, there is joy in the gospel ministry. And I hope for you that you uh, have recognized the joy of the gospel ministry and that that motivates you to jump right in and serve God in whatever way that he would call you to. And so uh, that's kind of the, that sets the stage a little bit here. But let's, uh, let's look now at the passage. I'm going to read here verse 17 of 1 Thessalonians 2. And I'll read all the way down through chapter 3 and verse number 8. And so if you'll look down there, you've got your Bible and I've got mine. I'm uh, reading from the old King James. You may have something else. That's fine. Uh, but 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I'll start reading in verse 17. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith that no man should be moved by these afflictions for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation even as it came to pass and ye know for this cause when i could no longer forbear i sent to know your faith lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain but now when timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity that ye have uh, good remembrance of us always desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. Father, I pray that in these moments as we examine these precious words that your Holy Spirit would confirm your holy words to our hearts that we would yield ourselves to you and that you would have your way right here in this room and in our hearts. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the Apostle Paul, you can see his uh, excitement to report back to the Thessalonians and uh, his excitement at the report of Timothy that they were doing well. 
And uh, so he begins here. And, and in this uh, passage here, in verse 17 of chapter 2, uh, it really seems to flow well, 17 all the way through the beginning of, uh, of chapter 3 there. And of course, the chapter divisions and even the verse divisions are not inspired. Uh, and so we've, we, uh, they're helpful for us so that we can all get to the same place as we're studying it together. But they're not inspired. This is all one letter. And so we, we read it that way, all uh, one continuous letter and, and uh, often one continuous thought. And so he begins here in verse 17 uh, talking about uh, how, how disappointed he was at some point that, that he couldn't spend more time with the Thessalonians. You see it there. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. If you remember, uh, the Apostle Paul had been teaching in Thessalonica, and the, the, uh, the Jews there persecuted him. They caused a riot. And, uh, and they, they caused this big riot, and the Apostle Paul evidently had been staying with Jason, was the man's name, and uh, they couldn't catch the Apostle Paul, and so the authorities caught Jason instead, and they convinced Jason uh, that, uh, that Paul should not speak any more of the gospel. And in fact, it, uh, it seems to be that they kind of threatened Jason with some kind of arrest or, or fine or something if Paul would continue to preach the gospel. And so Jason evidently had some kind of a meeting with the other Christians, the other believers there in Thessalonica. They made a decision, and, and we see it in Acts chapter 17, they made a decision to, to send Paul away. Let's just look at it quickly, Acts 17 and verse number 10, uh, just to get some of the uh, context here. Acts 17 and uh, verse number, uh, well, let's look at verse 9. When they had taken security of Jason, some kind of guarantee from Jason, maybe a threat of some sort of a, a fine, verse 9, when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. Then the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went to the synagogue of the Jews. Uh, just the fact that it was at night, I mean, you can tell there is some, uh, some pressure here and they're rushing through this and we, they've got to take care of Paul and they're concerned for his safety and, and uh, they don't want to see a riot in the city. And so uh, because of satanic attack, it would seem here, uh, the apostle Paul is chased out during the night. And so he leaves during the night and you can just imagine his heart at that time thinking, oh, I want to spend more time with the Thessalonians. I want to help them know more of the gospel. I want to help them understand the truth. I want to see them grow in their faith. But the apostle, the apostle could not. Uh, Paul had to move along. And so that's why he says here in verse 17, we were taken from you for a short time. In fact, the Greek word back in uh, verse 17 of Thessalonians, uh, 1 Thessalonians 2 the word uh, for being taken from you is, is closely tied to uh, the word that we get orphaned from. It's interesting, just, just taken away from. And, and so that's kind of the idea. He, he feels as though uh, they were taken away from him. He was, and, he, and he talks about it earlier in the chapter. He felt like a father to them, even like a nursing mother to them, taking care of them, and they were ripped away from him in this way. And so his desire is to see them. He wants to be with them. And that's what he says there in verse 17. Uh, and so even though he was taken away from them in presence, but not in heart, not in heart, uh, his heart was still with them. And, uh, and he wanted to see them with great desire. A lot of emphasis there. Now verse 18, he continues, wherefore we would have come unto you even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. So here's the Apostle Paul. He's in Berea, and, and I suppose he's thinking to himself, boy, I'd really like to go back. Maybe I can sneak back into Thessalonica and visit those Christians again and help them out. And uh, maybe I'll just sneak in secretly. But no, nope, here comes the Thessalonian Jews, and they spot him, and they, hey, get this guy, and they chase him out of Berea. And so Paul thought maybe to make some plans to go visit him, but that didn't work. So then he goes to Athens, and, uh, and we don't know exactly how Satan hindered Paul from visiting 
at that point, but uh, there in Athens, perhaps the Paul had, had, making, had made some plans to go visit them once again, but he was hindered again uh, by Satan. And Paul had to be left alone there at Athens, uh, as we'll see in uh, chapter 3 and verse 1. Look down there. Wherefore, we could no longer forbear. We thought it good to be left at Athens alone and sent Timotheus our brother. Uh, so again, Paul is left alone at Athens. He wishes he could go to Thessalonica, but he can't. He's hindered by Satan. The Apostle Paul is well aware of the enemy. And he knows that as he is in the gospel ministry, he will face opposition, and not just from the world. You know how it is. You try to serve God, and you try to present the gospel here in this world, and you get people who are unsaved, and they just don't like it. They don't want to hear it, and, and they just want to turn you off, and, and, uh, and, and they oppose you. And we may have a tendency to think, boy, the world... You know, they are our enemy. And in some respects, they are, but they, they're people that need redeemed. They're people that need the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who is the true enemy? It is, it is not that unsaved person that opposes you. It's not the, the government that is opposing or restricting your freedom. You know who the true enemy is. There is a great conspiracy, and the conspirator is the devil himself. He is the enemy. He's working things. You think your enemy is, is somehow in your family. Is it your family member or your friends or your neighbor? You know, I can't get along with them. You think they're your enemy. You're wrong. Your enemy is Satan himself. And the apostle Paul attributes this hindrance to his gospel ministry to the devil. You think about it. When a person gets saved, when we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior, the Bible teaches that we are translated from the, the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, the light of the dear Son. We are, we are moved from the darkness over to the light. We are taken from the grip of the devil himself and placed in the all-powerful hand of God the Father. And so the devil doesn't want to lose people. Boy, he's got a little kingdom. He's got something. He's got some power. And he'll do anything that he can to try to keep people from being saved. And one of the ways he does that is through discouraging Christians who have a gospel ministry. And, and I know how it is. You get into a, a gospel ministry and, and you want to serve and you want to do something. Something happens. You get discouraged. You get down. Things don't go the way that you want them to. And the devil starts attacking. And then you... Well, you might just kind of quit for a, a season. You think, well, you know, this is just temporary. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop serving. Maybe, maybe things will get better later on, and then I can serve once again. But it doesn't happen that way. If the devil can hinder you from the, your gospel ministry in one way, don't you think he's going to keep that hindrance up? You know, how do we fight back against the devil? Boy, he's, he's walking to and fro as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He wants to devour your ministry and devour your life and destroy the lives of those that are unsaved around you that you could reach with the gospel of Jesus. You and I have got to fight back. And you know, the apostle Paul was determined to continue his gospel ministry. Boy, he was chased out of Thessalonica. He was chased out of Berea. But he continued his gospel ministry. He was not going to quit preaching the gospel of Jesus. And of course, the devil didn't like that. And so the devil is hindering the ministry. I wonder, is the devil hindering your ministry? Has the devil caused some kind of havoc in your life? Has the devil discouraged you in some way so that you, you are not quite serving the way that you used to? Could it be that the devil is using circumstances around you, even friends and family members, to restrict the gospel ministry? Could it be that the devil is hindering the gospel work that God wants you to do? The Apostle Paul was determined. And so he says, I wanted to come to you once and again. Multiple times I wanted to come visit you, but the, but the devil, Satan, hindered us in this ministry. And why did he so long to be with them? In verse 19, he says, For what is our hope or joy 
or crown of rejoicing? Are not, ye, uh, are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? He answers his own question. He says, you know, our joy in the ministry, our hope in the ministry, our crown of rejoicing in the ministry is seeing you, is seeing the gospel manifest in your life is seeing the fruit of our labors. And there is coming a day when Jesus will return and we will be caught up together and we'll meet together with the other believers in the air. What a day that's going to be. And can you imagine? Can you imagine how exciting that's going to be when, when you meet with somebody in the presence of God the Father in glory, when you meet with somebody and they say, you know what, you shared the gospel with me and because of that, I'm here today. Wow, what a crown of rejoicing. What a wonderful thing. Praise God. See, this is what Paul is keeping his perspective on. He's so excited about the, the, the gospel ministry and the fruit. He wants to see those Thessalonican Christians growing in their faith. And so he wanted to go back, even if it was for selfish reasons, in a sense, just to be encouraged. Isn't it great when you when you see the fruit around you, you serve and you labor and you work and sometimes you don't see any fruit. But in those moments when God allows you to see some fruit of the labor, isn't that exciting? Boy, it just motivates you to think, wow, this is great. I'm going to keep going. You know, every now and again, somebody will say after the Sunday morning sermon, they'll say something, wow, they'll say, you know, what you shared this morning, Pastor Joel, was exactly what I needed. And, and you know what I say? Then I'm going to keep going. <laughs> you know, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep opening the scripture and we'll keep teaching the truth because that's what I want to see. The fruit, the fruit. It's so exciting. It's so wonderful. You know, it's not just a preaching ministry from the pulpit, though. You, you have a gospel ministry with your friends. You have a gospel ministry with your coworkers and with your neighbors and with your relatives. You have a gospel ministry with living out the gospel principles, showing the grace of God, speaking the truth in love. You have a gospel ministry. You have no idea. You have no idea the impact that you have on others. But someday, just maybe someday, you'll see it when Jesus returns and you'll see that crown of rejoicing. See, this is what Paul is longing for. And he says in verse 20, ye are our glory and joy. Ye are our glory and joy. It reminds me of what he said earlier. Uh, and if you look back in chapter two, uh, you see, let's see here, verse number eight so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. Again, the Apostle Paul isn't trying to build some little kingdom for himself and get, him, get a name for himself. His desire is the people. His love is the people, their souls. And he was willing to give his own soul for them. Is that what you're willing to do for others around you? Are you willing to give your very soul for them? If that's your motivation, then your crown of rejoicing is the fruit that is manifest in them when they follow the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm reminded of, of 1 John and what John says I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Boy, there's no greater joy than that. And those that you labor for and minister to, to hear that they walk in truth. And here the Apostle Paul is experiencing that right there. Verse uh, 1 of chapter 3, he continues now. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear... We thought it good to be left at Athens alone. Interesting word here, uh, just this, that he says we could no longer forbear. The idea is kind of cover it up. Uh, we couldn't cover up our, our anxiety in a sense. We were so desirous to see and hear of your faith. We wanted to know how you were doing. We couldn't cover it up anymore. We couldn't hold back anymore. We could no longer forbear. So I decided I'm going to be left at Athens and I'm going to send Timothy because I got to know how are you doing? 
How are you doing? I've got to know. And so he says here in verse 2, And sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. He says here, uh, even though I can't go and I can't minister to you, I have such a burden for you that I'll send somebody else. Maybe it's not an opportunity, maybe it's not an open door for me, but I'm going to send somebody else that can minister to you to establish you in the faith. And so the Apostle Paul has this interesting uh, ministry vicariously through Timothy. So Timothy goes to Thessalonica, and the goal for Timothy as a minister of God, that is a preacher, one that serves up, a deacon in sense, that serves up the Word of God, and a fellow laborer, somebody who's been working with the Apostle Paul, laboring together with God as any ministry is, here the, uh, this man Timotheus is to go and to establish them, to firm them up, to help them to be settled in their faith. Because don't you sometimes have doubts? And so did they, perhaps. And so the Apostle Paul wanted to make sure that those doubts, those doubts were taken care of, that they could have a firm foundation and a footing in the Word of God and to be established firmly in their faith so that no matter what happens in this life, I'm holding fast to Jesus Christ. I'm holding to the gospel. Nothing's going to shake me. Nothing's going to move me. I will not be moved from my position in Christ, my position of righteousness. I will not be moved from that. I will trust in him. And so here the, uh, the apostle sends Timothy to do just that, establish these believers, and then to comfort them in their faith. Boy, there are times when we need comforted. We need somebody to come alongside, put their arm around us, and just cry with us, and just pray with us, and just say, I, I don't know what the solution is, but I can tell you this, you're not alone. You're not alone in this persecution. You're not alone in this difficulty. You're not alone in this struggle. I can tell you this, I'm with you. I'm with you. And I may not know the answer, but God does. And arm in arm, we're going to stay strong in the faith. You know, we need that. We need that. We need each other. We need to encourage one another. We need to be uh, meeting with each other, calling each other, talking to each other, texting each other, whatever it is, to encourage one another to stay true, to remain faithful, and to continue on. You can't do it alone. God has given you His people. And so draw on those relationships and let God pour through people His grace on your life. And so Timothy goes for that purpose. What else? Verse 3, that no man should be moved by these afflictions for yourselves know that we were appointed thereunto. Timothy was to help them not to be moved from that faith. The Apostle Paul had given them the gospel of Jesus Christ and had shown them clearly from Scripture and had reasoned with them about the gospel, the free gospel. Oh, it cost Jesus everything that He had, but it's free to you and me. And that's the good news. And we are sinners, we are destitute, we need the Lord Jesus Christ, and we have no hope without Him. And so the Apostle Paul, once having established in them their sinfulness as he walks people through the gospel just in, in the book of Romans, then he gives them the grace of God, the righteousness that Jesus would pour out on you and give to you free, freely. Jesus took your condemnation. Jesus took your death penalty so that you could be made righteous in him. He said, boy, I just, I don't feel like I, I'm doing enough to, to, to be worthy of this or something or or I you know I just I feel like I've got to help him in some way I got to do something for this no you can't you can't do anything for it because he did it all that's why he said it's finished this is the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ and so the apostle Paul having given the gospel of Jesus Christ to them wants them not to be moved from that position of grace don't walk away from this Cling to this grace of God 
Don't let the devil drag you down and discourage you and cause problems through afflictions in your life so that you would just give up, walk away, and just go back to trying to work your way. You can't do that. And so the Apostle Paul establishes them vicariously through the ministry of Timothy. But I find it interesting what he mentions here in the end of verse 3. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Appointed to what? Well, to the, the afflictions that he was talking about. These, these afflictions and troubles and trials you see in the first part of that verse 3. We don't want you to be moved by these afflictions because you yourselves know that we're appointed to these. Do you know what that means? That means that there is no affliction that is happening in your life right now even though it may be driven by the devil himself, there is no affliction that is outside of the sovereign hand of God. And in fact, God in his grace and mercy and love allows those afflictions into your life for a purpose. You are appointed this affliction so that you may grow, so that you may become more and more like Jesus Christ. You are appointed to these afflictions. Don't be shocked by it. Don't be surprised. Sometimes people think, boy, if I just get saved, then everything will be wonderful in my life. And I wish that was the case, but it's not. Don't you see that even the afflictions that happen in your life are by the appointment of God himself to produce in you Christ-likeness. You need to be like Jesus. And so how do you respond to these things? Just look quick with, click quickly at the book of James with me. James chapter 1. Everybody's favorite passage. I don't know if it is your favorite or not, but verse number 2. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations. That's the trials and afflictions. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect, that is complete and entire Wanting nothing. God appoints struggles in your life because He's changing your perspective and He's trying to help you to be complete, complete in Christ, to be more and more like Jesus Christ. I think, boy, I just, I never feel like I've got a handle on things. Well, good. Because you never will. And that's why you need the Lord Jesus Christ. Somehow we've got it in our brains that if we just work a little harder, then we'll get the hang of it and we can do things. No. No, you need to trust Jesus Christ with everything. You know, when, when, when you hit the bottom and you're flat on your back, the best thing you ought to do is stay right there. Stay right there and trust Jesus Christ. You know, we've got to recognize that these trials and tribulations are for a purpose and for a reason. They're actually appointed, and we are appointed to them or for them. And so now we continue here back in 1 Thessalonians 3. In verse 4, the apostle says, For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation even as it came to pass. And you know, the Apostle Paul told him ahead of time, it's going to happen. We're going to face tribulations. And just as the Apostle Paul faces tribulations, don't you think that the followers of Jesus who learned from him will also face tribulation and persecution? Absolutely. But what did they do to Jesus? Can you expect that the world would treat you any differently? Can you expect that the devil would not oppose you just as he did Jesus Christ? Of course he will. 
And so you know it's coming. You know it's there. And by the way, giving up on your faith uh, doesn't make things easier. <laughs> like, okay, maybe I don't want this attack. I don't want... It's coming anyway. You need Jesus Christ. You need him. And so now you have him, so cling to him. He says, we told you before that we should suffer persecution as it came to pass. You know, you know. Verse 5 now, for this cause, when I could no longer forbear. And he reiterates the thought there in verse number 1. When I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. Uh, here the apostle Paul has his follow-up ministry. You know, we kind of, we think about it sometimes, follow, it's called discipleship. It's called not just leaving somebody in the lurch. You know, you give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and the truth is, the gospel is enough. But how many times have you forgotten the gospel? Right? I mean, I, I need reminded of the gospel all the time. And we need, to, we need to hear it over and over and over again that it's by the grace of God, that it's not of works lest any man should boast. I need reminded of that. And we're not just talking about salvation, friends. We're talking about living the Christian life for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because apart from me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. And so we need reminded of the gospel principles all the time. It's discipleship. And so we encourage one another and remind each other, oh, remember the gospel. Oh, that's right, that's right. Okay, I can't do this. I gotta let Jesus do this. And we remind ourselves and we remind one another and we disciple each other and teach each other and train each other. You know, the, uh, the RU program, we're gonna spend some time next month talking about the RU program and teaching some of the things that we teach in the RU program. The RU program, is, uh, is a discipleship program. Because the Bible says that ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And so if you want to have freedom from sin and problems and, and afflictions and addictions and, and trials and anxieties, if you want freedom from that, then you need Jesus Christ. And so that's what we give on Friday nights. Just like what we give every Sunday morning. And every Wednesday night, we give Jesus Christ its discipleship. And so the Apostle Paul wants to, to help them to know their faith, know the status of their faith, where are you at, he says in verse number five. And then he wants to know that they're not being tempted by the tempter because if that was the case and they turned away from this faith in Jesus Christ, then it would seem as though their labor is in vain. The Apostle Paul thinking, what am I doing this for? If you turn from the truth of the gospel, so cling to that truth and, and love the gospel of Jesus. Verses 6, 7, and 8, we finish it up. Now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith, and charity, that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as also as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted. Uh, the Apostle Paul was so thrilled to get this report. What was the report? Well, their faith was strong. They they had love one for another, and they had love for the Apostle Paul. And they weren't turning their back on the Apostle Paul just that they had received his message so they longed to have that connection with him as well. The Apostle Paul was so thrilled to know that, hey, you guys, you guys like me just as much as I like you and it's just not a like thing, right? This is, the, this is the brotherhood, the fellowship. He says, oh boy, you're my brothers and sisters in Christ and, and you want to be with me and I want to be with you because we're in the same family. It's such a sweet, wonderful fellowship that we enjoy together and so the apostle paul is greatly encouraged verse 7 therefore brethren we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith the apostle paul was beaten down in affliction and he was distressed Do you ever feel stressed out in life do you know what's an encouragement when you're when you're feeling distressed to see the faith of other people and specifically to see the fruit 
of your own labor. Don't give up in the gospel ministry because there's great joy in the gospel ministry. And when you pour yourself into others and you see God working in their lives by His grace, that encourages you to keep going in the distress, in the challenges, in the difficulties. You can keep going. What you need is a ministry. You know, I, I have people tell me, well, Pastor Joel, I'm really going through some tr struggles right now. As soon as this is taken care of, I really want to get involved. I want to do things. And by the way, I'm not thinking of anybody specifically. But folks have said this to me. And sometimes we use the stress and distress in our lives almost as an excuse to not do something in the gospel ministry that we feel God's Holy Spirit prodding and leading us to do. But you know what? What I have found is that when I'm stressed out and when I'm having difficulties, the more I pour myself into the gospel ministry, the greater joy that I have. And instead of focusing on me, oh man, it's so hard and life is so difficult. No, it's time to step out of my problems and my struggles. It's time to start serving the Lord God and serving other people. And when I do, I forget about my struggles. I forget about my problems. Because you know what? In the grand scheme of things, they don't matter. They don't matter. The Apostle Paul said, I will gladly spend and be spent for you. It's worth spending your life for. Because there's great joy. How do you get away from that stress? You serve the Lord God. That's what you do. Get a ministry. That's what you need. Don't be sitting around thinking, oh man, someday maybe I'll do something. Once this stress in my life is taken care of, then I'll do something. No, it, you're, waiting, you're waiting too long and it's never going to come. Verse number eight, the Apostle Paul says this, for now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. The Apostle Paul, in essence, says his life is all about the gospel ministry. And his life is worth living when he sees that fruit of his labor and others yielding to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's worth living. It's worth living. You might think to yourself, it's just not worth it. I just don't have the joy anymore. I, I, I'm burdened down. I'm struggling. I'm, I'm having too many difficulties in my life. I just can't go on anymore. Well, what you need is a gospel ministry. You need a gospel ministry. You need to serve the Lord, and you will find that life is worth living. That's what life is about, serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for the joy that you give us in the gospel ministry. I thank you for the peace that we have because of your Holy Spirit. I thank you for the love that you pour out unto us that can overflow out of our lives and out of our hearts to other people. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to see in the midst of distress and tribulation and difficulty, just as the Apostle Paul had joy we too may have joy and a crown of rejoicing when we give ourselves passionately for the gospel ministry. Lord, I pray that you would fill this church with servants, with people who are serving you and passionate for the gospel ministry. And Lord, I pray that if there's someone here this morning that's thinking, boy, you know, I just, I don't think I've ever received that gospel for myself. I don't even know if I understand it truly. Lord, I pray that today you'd work in their hearts, that we'd have an opportunity to talk to them and that they would embrace the truth of the gospel and have the joy that you can pour out in their lives as they serve you and serve others. Lord, we thank you for this gospel ministry. We pray that you would use us now for your honor and glory as we serve others in this gospel. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.